Life makes a difference. And you all look all blessed and highly favored. Is that, am I talking to the right folks? Good, good. Um, in uncertain times, we as believers can be certain about the character of God. We'll try that again. In uncertain times, there is a certainty that we have. And that certainty is in the character of God. That God is benevolent. We say God is good. And all the time. So we, we, when we say that, we're announcing or proclaiming God's benevolence, but we're also proclaiming his, his consistency. He's not just good, he's good all the time. And whether he sends something or not, he uses everything. So we're in a space right now that I believe will and is being God used. How many believe that God is using all that's gone on, all that has happened? All right, I appreciate the six people who are having faith with me on this. All right, I don't know where you stand, but this is what lets me sleep at night. This is what lets me assure my children, my grandchildren, the people that I interact with, the people who look to me for a word from God. Because that hope begins with me and my relationship with the Lord. Amen? So... Yeah, in uncertain times, and we are definitely in uncertain times, we have this certainty that the character of God remains consistent. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. And we can depend on that character. Now, if you don't know the character of God, if you're not familiar with the character of God, then you've got a problem. And it's important that you study the Word because God's character is revealed mo most officially and most consistently in the Scripture. Experiences are wonderful, but experiences must be tested by Scripture. So Scripture is critical. And when I think about where we are as the Church of Jesus Christ, I have been in ministry, Pastor Karen and I, for 42 years. We started when we were four years old, and we've been consistent in ministry. But I've seen a thing or two. That sounds like a commercial. Uh, we've seen a lot in those four decades in terms of the spiritual, moral climate, the growth, development of the Church of Jesus Christ, the shifts, the seasons, the things that blew in, blew up, and blew out. We've seen a lot. And one thing that I can say about certain movements, like the word of faith movement, which is one of the terms for it, some people call it prosperity gospel, name and claim it. Yeah, even truth can be taken to the extreme. Amen? And when truth is taken to the extreme, it becomes error. But one of the truths that came out of that whole word movement is a love and a foundation in Scripture. It was about the Word of God, knowing the Word, chapter and verse. It was understanding the Word, unpacking the Word. The Word was central. It was our source of faith, rule of conduct. It was foundational to all that we built in our personal lives, our spiritual lives, our relational lives, our business and ministry, all of that. And of course, what, what began to take the place of that is experience. So people wanted to have a spiritual experience and experiences began to become primary. They took the primacy uh, away from the Word of God. And it seems like, and I'm, 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 I'm trying to sense this prophetically and discern this, that God is calling us back to the foundation of the Word. Because Jesus responded 
to the devil with the word. He didn't speak in tongues. Not according to the, the biblical record. Are you with me? What did he respond with? The word. And what did Satan come back with? The word. So it's not just knowing the word lightly or in a shallow way. You've got to know it so that even when the devil comes back to you with scripture, trying to twist it and, and, and deceive you using what you trust and believe in, you better know what you're talking about. Come on, give God a good hand, clap off free. Amen. So the study of the word, studying to show yourself approved unto God, a workman that need not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth, applies now more than ever. And also that word that says, be ready to give an answer to everyone who asks you the reason for the hope that is in you in meekness and fear. You have got to have that word inside of you. If there's anything we witness from the temptation of Jesus in the wilderness is that Jesus taught us that we could tell the devil no. Oh, wait, that was deep. That, don't, don't, let, don't, don't let that go by you. He taught us that we can say no to the devil. Too often we engage in the circumstance, the situation, how we feel, all of that, Instead of realizing this is where we've got to draw the line and not even entertain what's coming at us. Because if we entertain it, it's going to start to mess with our emotions, our feelings, our thoughts. How many know what I'm talking about? Sometimes you've got to stop it at the door. The battle is in the mind. The scripture says you'll be transformed by the renewing of your mind, then you will be able to prove what is the good, acceptable, and perfect will of God, which means the state of your mind determines your ability to perceive what is good, what is acceptable, what is perfect, to perceive what God is doing, what God is willing. Yeah. Hallelujah. Like they say in the old church, I'll shout right here. Amen. So it's so important, folks, your relationship with Scripture. But we've seen over the last couple decades where spiritual experiences, and it's interesting because that's what this particular generation has favored. And the Scripture says, test the Spirit to make sure that it is from God. How do you test? that experience from the Word, the Word, the whole counsel of God, not just a piece, not just one verse here and one verse there. You cannot grow spiritually by knowing Proverbs and Psalms. Turn your neighbor and say, he's talking about somebody you know. You may not have a neighbor close to you. Shout it out. Come on, there are folks who think they can survive on Proverbs and Psalms. I read Proverbs in the morning and Psalm at night, and I'm good. No, there has to be more in your arsenal. You have to have a broad understanding of Scripture. And it is a lifelong study. I've been walking with the Lord since 1975, and I'm still learning and growing. You don't arrive. And if you think you've arrived, you're in trouble. We're always growing and learning and increasing in knowledge and wisdom and understanding. Amen? I want to share something with you, and I want to begin at Romans chapter 15, verse 4. And the reason I want to begin there is to just explain why or what my attitude is as I reach back into the Old Testament. In Romans chapter 15, verse 4, Paul is talking about his identification with Christ in terms of what he has gone through in ministry. And Paul has gone through a lot. We celebrate him, but the early church did not celebrate Paul. The Apostle Paul was somewhat of an outcast because of how Jesus dealt with him personally, privately, and apart from the Jerusalem church 
that was overseen by James and Peter. Paul's revelation was critical to the building of the church. These are his words, and I'm reading from the New International Version, 1984 edition. For everything, verse 4, Romans 15, 4. For everything that was written in the past was written to teach us. And read that again. For everything that was written in the past was written to teach us. In one translation, it specifically says the law. To teach us. They did not have a New Testament. When Paul wrote this, there was not a New Testament the way we have it. There was not the four Gospels, the book of Acts, the epistles, the, the Revelation. It was not neatly packaged until hundreds of years after the early church was formed and continued to develop. Too often we think when Jesus sent them out, he gave them a copy of the New Testament. No, it didn't exist. That developed over time. We have the benefit of the gospel records. We have the benefit of the uh, book of Acts. We have the benefit of the epistles. We have the benefit of Revelation. All right? We can take it up as a complete work and read it and appreciate it. So when he was saying for everything that was written in the past, he was speaking about the Hebrew Scriptures, what we call the Old Testament. They were written to teach us. So whenever you read the Old Testament, you should discover, remember, patterns, principles, precepts. And the fact that Paul says we can reach back into the Old Testament and learn things, it means that those things, though they were written in the past, have principles that apply today. So when we reach back, it's not just for information purposes, all right, or informational purposes only. It's what can I get from that that I can apply today? Because it's applicable. Not everything, but there are principles, precepts, concepts, ideas that are there, patterns that are there that I can apply. For everything that was written in the past was written to teach us so that through endurance and the encouragement of the what? It's up on the screen if you don't have it. All right. So that through endurance and the encouragement of the scriptures, we might have what? Hope. Through endurance and the comfort of the scriptures. So the scriptures are there to teach us, instruct us, correct us, exhort us, but at the end of the day, to give us hope, to comfort us with hope. The prophet Isaiah spoke words to a nation in distress, the nation of Israel. And he announced that God was about to do something new. But he had to frame their thinking, their attitude, in order for what God was about to do to be effective. Let's go to Isaiah 43, and we'll begin at verse 18. Again, I'm reading out, reading out of the New International Version, 1984 edition. And what's so beautiful about technology, you can have 35 different Bible translations right on your phone. Anybody have a Bible app? Okay. Some hands didn't go up. I'm praying for y'all. You have no reason not to have a Bible with you at all times. Because you have your phone with you. You have your device with you at all times. Amen? Amen? Praise the Lord. Isaiah 43, verse 18. The prophet speaks. 
forget the former things. He's not saying forget the past. He's saying forget what the past exposed you to. Forget the systems and structures of the past. Forget the way you thought in the past. Forget the way you understood in the past. Forget the former things. Do not dwell on what took place. How many know that your future can be held captive to your past? There are some people that are still struggling to move on from what happened to them. And remember, it's not what happened to you, it's what you do about it, how you respond to it that determines your future. Jesus came to set captives free, to open prison doors, and the past can either serve you with wisdom and instruction to invest in the future, or it can hold you in a prison. Amen? There are some people, because they've been burned, they will refuse to trust anybody and wonder why they can't have a relationship with anybody. Because all relationships are based on what? Trust. The past should make you wiser. But you should not live there. Dwell means to live there, to establish your habitation there, to pitch your tent there. Let the past serve you. And you must have a positive evaluation of the past, even if that past was hurtful and negative. Because God takes, and we were singing it, what was meant for evil, and he brings out of it a greater good. We don't always see that greater good when we're going through it. But again, it is our hope that's based upon our trust that God always has our best interests in his heart. Good place to clap. Thank you. Clapping is an affirmation. So the prophet announces, forget the former things. Do not dwell on the past. And again, I went through old systems, old structures, right? All of those things. You see, we feel, we gravitate to what's comfortable and what's familiar. I'm going to try that one more time. We gravitate to what's comfortable and what's familiar. Come on. You walk into a room and there are people. All right? What do you look for? Someone you know. Come on, isn't it true? That's the first thing we do. Ah, uh, you're looking around in the, in the crowd. Who do I know here? Right? So we look for the familiar. And when we can't find someone we know, when we can't identify the familiar, then we look for a place to make ourselves comfortable. Am I talking to anybody? Wave at me in the balcony. Let me know you. you, you, I'm talking to you. Come on, isn't it true? We walk in. If we can't identify somebody that looks familiar, we don't know. We look for a chair, a corner, a table where nobody but us can be there, and we sit down. Right? That's the way we are as human beings. We look for the familiar. We look for the comfortable. And yet, in order to grow, God has to take us into unfamiliar territory. God has to make us uncomfortable. Amen? Just because the Holy Spirit is called the comforter, he's not there to make you comfortable. I'm going to try that one more time. Just because he's called the comforter, he's not there to make you comfortable. No. God can disrupt your life, disrupt society, 
disrupt the course of things, disrupt patterns. God can do that, but he always has a reason behind it. So in verse 18, the prophet announces, forget the former things, do not dwell on the past. Verse 19 opens with that very important word, see, then the comma, which means pause, right? King James, it says, behold. Essentially, it means take a look, pay attention, observe. Amen. And the fact that God has to stop right there through the prophet and say, see, pay attention, take a look, is because God can be at work and you miss it. I don't know about you, but in my walk with the Lord, especially in my early walk with the Lord, I miss God a few times. Oh, I just confessed. I know y'all thought I had it all together all my life. Guess what? I'm still working on me. I'm still working on it. I'm still growing and learning. And I cherish those moments where I fail to see his hand because the next time I was ready. Come on. Failure is the womb for success. I'm going to say that again. Failure is the womb for success. Don't be afraid of failure. It's at those moments where I wasn't trained, wasn't mature enough, didn't have enough word, didn't have enough understanding, and it forced me to learn, to grow, to seek understanding, to sharpen my discernment and my perception of things and my perspective of things. This is what growth is all about. So the prophet says, see, I am doing a new thing. And I will tell you, we've been through a lot as a planet, as a nation, as a community, as a people, as a family, as a church, as a business, whatever it may be. We have experienced unprecedented times. This has never happened before. Even though we reach back 100 years and we look at the Spanish flu and the impact that it had on the globe in 1918, this is unprecedented. Where we are, what we've experienced. And in the midst of all of this, what does God say? What's the word of the Lord? I'm doing a new thing. And what I'm about to do, in fact, what I am doing already is not to be judged by what I've done in the past. I'm going to try that one more time. What I am doing now is not to be judged by the past. So whatever I've done in the past, that's nothing compared to what I'm doing now. And what I can do in the future. I appreciate those same eight people. It increased by two. That's good. So verse 19. See, I'm doing a new thing. Now it springs up. Do you not perceive it? Wow. Jesus talked to a crowd and he pointed to religious leaders who should have known And yet he said, they have eyes and they cannot, come on, see. They have ears and they cannot hear. Their hearts are hardened so it cannot understand or process. I think about the things that frustrated Jesus just from some of the remarks that he made and unbelief and fear, all those things bothered him. That's why we we say, well, if God was right here, man, let's do it. He was right here 2,000 years ago. And the people around him had a hard time believing and trusting. Right? In fact, Jesus put it this way. He said, those who have seen are at one level, but blessed are those who have not seen him and yet 
believe. Those who don't have the physical evidence, and yet they have the trust. Hallelujah. I'm talking about the just who live by faith. The people who walk by faith and not by sight. Are there any in the room? Hallelujah. Forget the former things. Don't dwell on the past. I'm doing a new thing. Now it springs up. Do you not perceive it? I'm making, and I love the language, because the Bible uses poetic language, metaphor, figures of speech, symbolism. Listen to the beauty of all this. I'm making a way in the desert and streams in the wasteland. The wild animals honor me, the jackals and the owls, because I provide water in the desert and streams in the wasteland to give drink to my people, my chosen, the people I form for myself, that they may proclaim my praise. Are you hearing all of this? In the midst of the wilderness and the desert, his people are going to proclaim his praise? Well, we need to examine why. Essentially here, God is calling his people to remember what he did for them in the exodus from Egypt. But what he's about to do is even greater. The metaphors, right? A way in the desert or a way in the wilderness. The wilderness is symbolic language. It's literal in certain places, but here... He's using as metaphor, because remember, after they left Egypt, where did they end up? In the wilderness, right? And what did God do for them in the wilderness? He provided for them. He guided them. He directed them. A pillar of fire by night, a cloud by day, the provision of food, the protection around them from the wild beasts. God demonstrates his power in the wilderness. And boy, do we have wilderness experiences in our lives. Amen? Away in the wilderness. In other words, where there is no clear path forward, God creates one. I'm going to try that one more time. He said, I make a way in the wilderness, right? Come on, you know the old preaching, God will make a way where there is no way. So not only is he announcing to them that he's about to do something new, he's telling them to have hope and be fearless. Because even though they may be in a place where they cannot see the path forward, it's not clear. It's ambiguous. We're trying to figure it out. Listen, churches across the country, around the world, pastors especially, are trying to figure this all out. I'm looking forward to full re-entry, but I know that it's not going to be the same as it was. It's a new model. It's a new experience. Yes, we all have remnants of the old and coming together and the power and the anointing and the presence of God. I look forward to the power of the corporate anointing. But still, it's going to be new. It's going to be different. So where there is no clear path forward, God creates one. How about this? Streams in the desert. And notice, we we can read the text and think that when it says the jackal, they honor him. The wild animals honor him. He creates streams. But it's not saying he creates streams for these wild animals and that's why they honor him. No, as we read down in the text, the streams are to give water to his people. Rivers in the desert, where there is no natural relief or refreshment, God will provide it. Oh, come on. You get in the wilderness journey, all right? Sometimes you say, okay, Lord, I I, I feel that, you know, there's more miles for me to travel on this journey, but I could use some refreshment right now. I could use rebuilding right now. Where there's no natural relief or refreshment. Because in the desert, there's no natural relief or refreshment. Unless you come across an oasis. Amen? That's why it's called a desert. The wild beasts 
honor me. The wild animals honor me, jackals and ostriches. In other words, listen, the things that may threaten you won't because he's there with you. I'm going to try that one more time. Look, the reference to wild animals, what are we concerned about? If you, you can't sleep. Night comes, you lay down to sleep, and there are wild animals. You, you, you hope that somebody's watching. And what is God saying? The things that threaten you while you're in this space won't hurt you because I am with you. I'm doing a new thing. Did you all hear that? I'm doing a what? New thing. There are forces at work. And when God says he's doing a new thing, he's talking about renewal. He's talking about revival, what we understand as revival and renewal. So I'm going to put some things on the board so you could see this. Think about it. Social, political, moral, spiritual, economic, guess what? These are all forces. They're all what? I can't hear you. They're all what? Forces. Forces. Got it? Forces. And guess where you are? Guess where you are? You're in the middle of those forces. And they're constantly at work. Constantly at work. When we think about where we are as, as a society here in America right now, this is, let me, I, I use this as an illustration for service. Let me use it again. All right. We're in what is called a seller's market, real estate. Why are we in a seller's market? Because there is a great demand for housing. Whether it's an apartment, whether it's, 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 it's a private home, a condominium, a townhouse, whatever, all right? There is great demand, but very little supply. And that's basic economics. That's economic 101. When the demand is high and the supply is low, the prices go up. So if you're in the market to buy a house right now, you're at a disadvantage, and you've got to really be sharp. Why? Because the houses that are on the market, the few houses that are available, the few apartments or condominiums, whatever, are available, right? The prices are being jacked up. So it can cost you 20, 30 percent more than the actual value of the property that you are looking at purchasing. And, and the sellers have the advantage because they know that there is little supply and great demand. So they're willing to wait. They know that the interest rates are low right now, so that puts added pressure for those who are looking and who need to buy. So it's a seller's market. That's economic forces. Got it? But there are also social and political forces at work. So if you're a seller, it's a good time to sell. You hear that? If you're selling a property, it's a good time to sell. Here's another force. Scheduled that July 31st will be the end of government protection against eviction. During COVID, government passed a rule that 
says to banks who hold mortgages on homes that you cannot foreclose or evict the homeowner because they're struggling financially right now. So it gave people relief. Got it? People who are renting an apartment. Policy established that says you cannot evict people out of the apartment right now because people are struggling. But once they lift that, are you with me? Now banks can begin foreclosure or demand that people pay up what they owe in back payments that they couldn't pay because of COVID crisis. They can offer them the opportunity to refinance, but what if their financial condition doesn't allow them to refinance? Because they may be now a bad credit risk. Are you hearing me? So what's going to happen is they're going to either be forced to sell or go into foreclosure which means that now these houses will enter the market that was scarce and the market is going to be populated with a lot of available homes being sold out of a crisis situation. The interest rate is then going to go up to respond to market availability. These are all social and political factors and economic factors that shape and influence the wilderness. Are you hearing me, folks? This is real. This is real. So to have a promise from God that he's going to step in and make a way where the way does not look clear, where he's going to refresh you and provide water for you, Are y'all hearing me out there? This is the kind of hope that we need. Now, can God intervene in spite of all of these forces? That's what he does. And if you've known him for any period of time, you know that our extremity becomes his opportunity. There goes those eight people again. (laughs) Renewal is a restructuring. Renewal is where you reflect on how things have been done, and it's time for a change. It is a season of improvement in strength. You become stronger out of it. It's a season of something becoming more active and more important. Things that may have been on the back burner, God is now having you push on the front burner. Things that were not a priority are now become a priority. Amen in here? Renewal is a reawakening of passion towards purpose. Because now you're asking, re-asking the question, okay, Lord, in the face of all of this, let me re-establish what my purpose is. It's a reawakening of your gifts, your talents, your abilities, how you're wired, the personality, how God created you, and how that applies in the marketplace and in life. It is a restoration of vigor and and, and, and life and consciousness because you become more sensitized, more aware of what's happening around you so that you can discern what the next step should be. It is structural renewal, personal renewal, relational renewal, cultural renewal, spiritual renewal. It's all of those things happening And God says, in the midst of all of that, I give you hope. Let's go to Luke, Gospel of Luke, chapter 5, verse 37. Luke 5, 37. 
Jesus speaking here. And let me wrap with this. He's talking about doing something new. And remember, he was bringing in a whole new worship system. Remember what he said about the sacrificial system in Jerusalem? He said, not one stone is going to be left upon another. Did you all get that far in the book? Amen? He said, this temple is going to be destroyed. Jerusalem is going to be destroyed. That's what he said. Why? He had to replace that system. Otherwise, they wouldn't let it go. And sometimes God has to disrupt the past. Force us to judge it so that we can embrace the future. And this is why. This is what Jesus said. He said, no one, verse 37, Luke 5, 37. No one pours new wine into old wineskins. Now, a wineskin was made usually of, of goat skin, but it was sealed to keep whatever liquid that was placed in it from leaking, but also to keep it from spoiling. They would put not only wine, but milk or whatever they would put in it. But that was a faithful bag that they would use. However, over time, all right, it would get to a place where if you put new wine in it, it would be a problem because the new wine in the wineskin still goes through a process of fermentation, which means it's expanding the skin. And then the skin can ultimately burst because it can't contain what's happening with that new wine in it. Hello. Let's go back to it, verse 37. And no one pours new wine into old wineskin. If he does, the new wine will do what? Burst the skins. The wine will run out and the skins will be ruined. So not only do you lose the wineskin, you lose the new wine. So the old and the new are lost if the transition from old to new is not done carefully. Amen. And change is not an event. It's a what? It's a process. Come on, CCC, ice. Change is not an event. It is a what? It's a process. And you have to manage the process carefully. Otherwise, you can shock the system and it will implode. So what is Jesus saying? You've got to deal with the wineskin before you can put the new wine into it. New wine must be poured into new wineskins, which means new systems, new structures, new way of thinking, new way of doing, new way of understanding. So you can have new and possibilities for the new in the future, but if you don't adjust the present, if you don't just adjust what's going to carry that future, then both the future and the present will be lost. That makes sense? So we know that in, 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 in terms of our use of resources, our staffing, I mean, everything. We are reevaluating everything about the ministry. And what we're doing with the ministry, businesses are doing, families are doing. Guess what? You should be doing it personally. You should be excited about becoming lean and mean. Come on. Because we can become so comfortable, so familiar, right, that we waste. And it's not until we're challenged that we are then ready and willing to tighten our belts, reevaluate what we do, how we do it. Crisis doesn't come to kill us, it comes to make us better. Amen? And guess what? Some folks won't want to let go of the old in order to embrace the new. I'm going to try that. Boy, you all got quiet on that one. I hope you're not one of the some folks. Some folks, people have a hard time with change. They get comfortable. They get familiar. They don't want to change. Amen? Yeah. But if the body of Christ doesn't change, if the church doesn't change, it will lose its savor. 
and it will be good for nothing but to be cast out, trampled under the foot of men. We've got to adjust to all of these factors and forces that are in play. Yes, the Holy Spirit remains the same. The message remains the same. The principles, patterns, precepts remain the same. But the methodology, how we deliver it, changes. Amen? Yeah. We're still doing church. We're just doing it differently. But remember what I've taught you. We live life on what? Levels. We arrive in what? Stages. And as we move from one level to another, our relationships sometimes must change because everyone is not moving to that next level with us. And I will tell you, when you talk about new and old wine, right? Old wineskins and new wine. I intentionally, over the years, have gone back to old neighborhoods that I've lived in just to look at it. And I will tell you, sometimes in certain neighborhoods that I've gone to, because I I used to live in Williamsburg before it became Williamsburg. (laughs) When I was there, it was gangs, it was drugs, it was prostitution. Pastor Karen used to minister to the prostitutes down on Kent Avenue developed a relationship with them and, and talked to them. And I look at them and say, come here, what are you doing? <laughs> Never get the story of where she was driving in the car and the boys were in the car and one of them was on the, on the road stranded. She, she, she picked the girl up, had her come in the car, and the boys were in the back seat. I'm telling. <laughs> that was the Williamsburg we knew. Housing crisis. Now, it's a whole new Williamsburg. Back then, a four-room railroad apartment was $110 a month. I told you we started when I was four, right? Okay. (laughs) You go back to those neighborhoods, you see, wow, this has changed. Have you ever visited one of your old neighborhoods and see how much has changed? But there's another reality. You also discover things that still the same. Still haven't changed. Still the same. And should have changed. But they didn't. Look at what Jesus said in verse 39. And no one, after drinking new wine, wants the old. If you all don't correct me, I'm going to be disappointed with you as students. I'm going to try it one more time. And no one, after drinking new wine, wants the old. Just the opposite. No one, after drinking the old wine, wants the new wine. For he says the old is better. And aren't there people like that? They reject the new, reject change, because they want to stay stuck in the familiar and the comfortable. And they say, no, this is better. They even make up songs like it. Give me that old-time religion. Give me that old-time religion. What? (laughs) What is Jesus saying? He's warning. And as much as I'm telling you that we need to change the wineskins to hold a new wine, some people are going to resist it. Some people are not going to embrace the change and the future. I know pastors who are waiting to get back in the building so they can go back to the way things were. They're going to be shocked that the neighborhood has changed. I know what I'm talking about. Instead of realizing that there's going to be a new normal and trying to understand, discern that new normal, and adjust their ministry to that new normal, they're not changing anything and hoping and expecting to go right back to what was. That's not real. That's not what's happening. And not only in ministry, we see it in business. We see it in people's thinking. God's doing a new thing, and it's going to take a new you to hold the new thing that God is doing. Oh, come on, give God a good hand. Did you get anything out of this today? I live with hope. 
I live with expectation that there are opportunities all around me. And the forces at work out there for my good are greater than the forces at work out there for my detriment. I'm going to try that one more time. I just, I just, I just rephrase Romans 8.28. I believe that the forces out there that are at work for my good are greater than the forces out there that are at work for my detriment. I believe that greater is he that is in me. I'm in the book. That is word. Than he that is in the world. I believe that whatsoever is born of God overcomes the world. And what's the victory that takes us there? Faith. Our faith. I believe that. So I live in the book. And I let that word inform my mind, my emotions, my feelings, my choices. I let that word marinate in my head. Because whatever I give space to, that's what's going to influence my choices. And your choices determine your destiny. Amen? I'm pumped and excited to see what God is going to bring out of all of this. I believe he's already at work. And God always takes us from the lesser to the greater. I'm going to try that one more time. God always takes us from the lesser to the greater. From the old to the new, but from the what? Lesser to the greater. That is the pattern within Scripture, that we move from one level to another, from the lesser to the greater, and the greater is right in front of us. Any believers in here? Come on, stand on your feet. Give God some praise. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Now, here's the paradox. Jesus made all of these promises of protection and goodness. And yet, at the same time, he said, in the world, you're going to have tribulation. But be of good cheer, for I have overcome. And when I look at that, and I, I say, well, okay, what does that mean for me? I go back and I study the scripture. I study the gospels to see how he handled the challenges that came his way and how he, o he overcame them because he was in all points tempted, tested, challenged as I am. So I go back to see how he handled betrayal. How did he handle abandonment? How did he handle lack? How did he handle those in power? How did he handle those close to him who still didn't get it? How did he handle <laughs> How did he handle? Because that is what teaches me to face the tribulation that he said I would have in this world. Come on, let's bow our heads. Father, thank you for your presence. Thank you for the community, the church. And thank you that you keep it all together with your word. Father, thank you that if your word sustains the universe and keeps it all together, your word can sustain my life and keep me all together. So I surrender to that word as my source of faith, my rule of conduct, my hope for the future. Bless us today as we leave here embracing the new things that you're doing letting go of the old and experiencing that new wine. We thank you. We bless you. In Jesus' precious name, amen and amen. Come on, give God a good praise. <laughs> Hallelujah! <laughs> Keep the ministry in prayer as we make changes. Keep the families 
of our leadership in prayer. Remember, smite the shepherd and the sheep scatter. So the devil's always after the leadership in any way that he could attack. And the pattern is family, money, health. He just recycles it. So keep us in your prayers. Amen? I'm not announcing anything wrong or bad. We're good. But when I would do good, <laughs> evil is present. And how many know evil is not present to help you do good? It's, stop, it's to stop you from doing the good that you would do. Praise the Lord. Amen? Hallelujah. It's been a pleasure being with you in the house. And those of you who are watching online, it's been a pleasure being with you in your house. Whatever, well, almost whatever room you're in. <laughs> Thank you for joining us. Thank you for being part of our spiritual family as we continue to grow. Thank you for the letters that you write in to let us know that your life is better because you're here, because you're learning and growing and part of this community. Let's say something good as we leave this place, but never God's presence. But we're going to have a minister come and pray before we do that. I'm sorry. <laughs> See, I'm so used to. It is. But we're going to have a minister come and pray because someone, someone online watching us from anywhere in the world may never have received Jesus Christ into their heart. And we want to make sure they get the opportunity. This is our altar call. Amen. Thank you, Minister Misha. Praise the Lord. Family, we conclude every service by saying Jesus is Lord. But we can't do that without giving someone the opportunity to make him Lord. Israel shared some good news today. Your breakthrough is here. And it is not just here in a new season of favor, but in the person of Jesus. It is not just renewal in the atmosphere, but renewal in us. Pastor Bernard told us that the familiar and the comfortable have been changed. We have endured a season of unfamiliar trials, but God has been working all things together for our good. And today, God says, forget the former things. Do not dwell on the past. See, I am doing a new thing. Now it springs up. Do you not perceive it? I am making a way in the wilderness and streams in the wasteland. No matter how confusing your wilderness, no matter how barren your wasteland, no matter how long your wait, something new has begun. And everything in your past, as pastor told you, came to teach you so that when properly understood in the context of truth, you might have hope. Today, there is hope because there is good news. The good news is that a holy God so loved a rebellious world that he sent his only begotten son to live a sinless life, die in our place, and rise from the grave, conquering death. And in doing so, he paid the price for our sin and gives us a right to everlasting life. The good news is that God's grace is bigger than our flaws. The good news is that God's love is bigger than our sin. The good news is that God is neither limited by our troubles nor troubled by our limits. If God is going to do a new thing, he's got to change the old you. The good news is that he can with new wine, new skin, new word, a new will and a new won't, a new willingness to draw new lines and live life with new boundaries, a new willingness to inspect old lines and see if they reflect God's wisdom. We can know him today. We can be saved. Romans 10, 9 says that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. If you would like to do that, just repeat after me. Father, I repent of my sin. I believe Christ died on the cross and rose again to pay the price for my sin. I confess him as Lord and Savior and your word says I'm born again. Thank you Lord. Thank you Lord. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Family, let us give God praise in this moment. And family, we believe that if you prayed that prayer that you are born again. But change is not an event, it's a process. 
Now the journey in Christ begins. Now we get to be representatives of God's rule in the world and to represent his rule, we need to know his rules. Now we reflect his character, which means we need to study to become more like him. Now, as Pastor Jamal says, we create beauty, which means we get to discover with God's hand upon us what our gifts, talents, and abilities are for and what we were created to do. We have some information we would like to give you, so text or call the number you see on the screen. May God continue to bless you. Your life will never be the same. Amen. Praise the Lord. I love Minister Misha's passion. He can have church all by himself. He doesn't need a, a congregation. He can do it by himself. Praise the Lord. If you prayed that prayer, we welcome you to the family of God. God made it simple, not complicated, because he didn't want anyone to have an excuse. Surrender to Christ. That's all it takes. Believing that he rose from the dead, died on that cross just for you. Thank you for being with us, and thank you, all of you, who made your way out today. Now, let's say something good as we leave this place, but never God's presence. Jesus is Lord, period. We proclaim it, we believe it, and we're seeing it come to pass.